Having an employee go rogue and exhibit behavior that a company can ex can't control is the greatest fear that any brand has. Whether it's how they behave on social media, or it's what they do in an interaction with the customer, or if it's they get drunk, get thrown in jail, get arrested, show up on the front page of a newspaper, and they're wearing a t-shirt with a company logo on it. What employees do is a huge reflection on brands and what customers and what supporters think of these brands. Now, there's a situation that we have that makes employees behave like this. And we create a vortex of ignorance about what it is that employees understand that our companies do and what it is that we stand for. I want to tell you a little story about the Ventellas. The Ventellas were a couple, and they were doing some upgrades on their kitchen, and they said, we want to buy a new microwave. And they were good consumers. They did their homework. They looked at online reviews, and they talked to their friends, and they talked to other people who had just bought microwaves. And they decided to settle on a, on a Whirlpool because they felt it was a good quality brand. So they bought their microwave, and they brought it home, and they installed it, and everything was going along really well. They were super happy. And then a couple months into their purchase, it broke. So they called Whirlpool's customer service, and they sent somebody out to repair it, and he repaired it, and it worked. But the funny thing is, not so funny to the Ventellas, is that this happened five more times in a matter of a few months. So it wasn't just that they had to have the microwave fixed once, it's that they had to have a repairman come out and refix problems that they had already fixed. And the Ventellas called a customer service line at Whirlpool and they said, can we just call this what this is? We bought a lemon. Can we just take our microwave and give it to you and you give us a new one that actually works? And Whirlpool says, well, that's not exactly how we do things here. What we need to do, we have a process, and you actually need to hold on to your microwave until the end of the one-year warranty period, and then we'll send out a repairman, and they'll verify that it actually is still broken, and then we'll take your microwave for $75 to have it disposed of. Now, keep in mind, they only paid $216.25 for the microwave to start with, and now they have to pay Whirlpool $75 to take it away and then have it, to have a new microwave come in. And to top it all off, Whirlpool says, we also want you to sign this agreement as a loyal Whirlpool customer that says, other than attorneys, you won't talk to any other third parties about this. You won't talk to the media, you won't give interviews. You're a loyal customer and we want you to support the brand. Interestingly, that's not what the Ventellas did. They happened to know somebody who was a reporter for the New York Times and it exploded from there. What was extra salt in the wounds for the Ventellas is that this was going on during the time that Whirlpool was celebrating their 100th anniversary. And what was the external message that they were sharing to the world? Is that Whirlpool's a brand that's full of pride, passion, and performance for their things that they sell, for their products, and for how they treat their customers. But this was not at all the experience that the Ventellas had. And it was a very strong lesson that Whirlpool taught, that customer is a, Customer experience is about what you actually do. It's not about what you say you will do. But the reason there's such a disconnect between what Whirlpool said and how they were treated as a customer, the Ventellas, is because Gallup does research and they found out that 41% of all employees don't even know what makes their company different or what it is that they stand for. So there's an incredible amount of ignorance about what's going on and what, what's the right thing to do for our companies as employees. And you think, well, how can that be? Because we created our mission and our vision and our values, and we have these posters hung up everywhere in conference rooms and hallways, and we put it on all the memos from the president. So here's an example of what a mission, vision, value statement looks like. And if you're an employee for this company and you hear the, the mission to harness superior thinking in the creation of products, that functionally and visually enhance the spaces in which people live whilst reducing a carbon footprint. I, I kind of wonder how many meetings they had to have to decide whether or not they would include the word whilst in their mission statement and how much that really reflected what it is the brand stood for. And you, you think, well, this is kind of ridiculous. You know, this is one example of a, couple, of a company and how they handled it. But you look at mission and vision value statements and it doesn't matter what form they take. This is one where they said, let's put an acronym across the top and let's put words down that explain it because that'll be easier for employees to understand and to live what it is that we stand for as an employer. 
Well, maybe that's too complicated. So let's put it in a circle and connect all the points together with puzzle pieces and then have some things point to the middle and say that's our core values. That's something that employees will really understand. And if that's too complicated or maybe too artsy for you, let's take something really super solid like a Greek-looking building and let's put words on columns because that's something that really matters to employees. But what happens, even when we take an opportunity and make it more succinct, and make it something that employees can understand, like this one from Ernst & Young. It says, people, who we are is values. People who demonstrate integrity, respect, and teaming. How that actually manifests in the content that we create for employees is still a horrible experience. But what it is that we're doing with the content that we create and how we approach our relationship with employees is that we are teaching them to tune us out. We're so terrible at connecting with employees as an audience that they don't want to have anything to do with us. They don't want to listen to us. And this is how we're creating this vortex of ignorance where employees don't even know what we stand for. And they don't think it matters how they behave. They don't think it reflects on the companies that we work for. There's something that we have to start to do, and that's we have to reallocate how it is that we look at the communication that we send to employees. So if you take all of the communication that we send out to employees and you look at how, how it's weighted, about 80% of what it is that we use to connect with employees is corporate jargon, it's mundane things, a lot of it is HR oriented, it's things they have to know and we have to give them for information. I hear companies say, we're doing a new program, a new benefits program, just take last year's spreadsheet, update the dates, and then make sure it fits this year, and then that's what we'll do. So it's same thing next year, I can ignore it just like I always have done, just mark some dates on my calendar and I'll be good. Now, there's a part of what we do that has to cover crisis communication. For that time when that employee gets drunk, thrown in jail, shows up on the front page of the newspaper wearing a t-shirt with our company logo on it. And then if there's any time left over, if there's a little bit of sliver of time, we say, hey, let's do something fun. Let's do something that'll make employees happy. You know, it's Friday afternoon. What can we do? It's summer. How can we make what we communicate to employees fun, engaging, and different? But the problem is that we only do it if there's a little bit of time left over, and we don't have a plan to make it a sustainable approach to how we connect with audiences. And this is how we are doing a disservice to our greatest audience that we have. Now, I want to tell you a story about a, about a company that does a tremendous job at this. It's Molson Coors, and they're in my own backyard. I'm from Denver, they're in Golden, Colorado. This is Jill Hollingsworth, and Jill is the Senior Director of Executive Internal, Internal Communication for Molson Coors. They have 6,000 employees worldwide. And in 2005, Molson, which was a Canadian brewery, and Coors came together as one company. When Jill started working there in 2009, she said, Holy smokes, this, this, these weren't her exact words to her executive team, but she said, holy smokes, we have a freaking mess here. People don't know anything about the company. They don't know what we stand for. They don't know what matters. We're distributed geographically. We have different responsibilities. It's just a hodgepodge of what's going on. So she said, what we needed to do, what Molson Coors needed to do as a company, is take the special recipe that makes Molson Coors different and unique, just like they do with beer that secret recipe, and define it for everybody. So she worked with employees globally, she worked with the executive team, and they printed out, they created a book that shares the purpose, the ambitions, and the behaviors of what it is, what it's like, what it means to work for Molson Coors. They put it together in this book that's called Our Brew. And it was the first time that the company had one single place that all employees could go to and understand what does it mean to work here and what's my individual role and purpose. Because it talked about what are the roles and responsibilities, not just rules, but expectations of an employee if you represent the Molson Coors brand. And then they did something unheard of. They shared it with employees. And they not only shared it, they taught all 6,000 employees globally what this document meant, what it included, what their role was in creating the special recipe that, that made up that Molson Brew, Molson Coors Brewery brand. The next thing they did is that they said, we don't want to talk like every other corporate entity. We don't want to use words like optimize, monetize, anything that has an eyes in it. 
We're a brewery, and if you can't have fun when you work for a beer company with your employees, you're doing something ridiculously wrong. So they said, you know, when we sit down and have a beer with a buddy in a pub, there's a certain kind of vocabulary and relaxed nature about us. We want that same feeling and sense to come into all of our communications that we have with our employees. So they created a vocabulary and a language and a style of writing that's called pub talk. And the, uh, the intention is that it would sound just like if Craig and I were sitting there having a beer. We're going to relax, we're going to talk like real people talk. They send all of their corporate communications through a filter and it has to be pub talk approved before it's sent out to any employees. So you can see right on here, it says this book is free from business jargon. That's a big focus of how they communicate. Another thing that they did is that they created a content hub for employees. And in this case, it's called BrewTube, and it's video oriented. But it's one place where all employees in the entire company can come, and they can hear updates on financial information, because each department has financial goals that they have to hit. And so they can go at any time and see what's the latest update in the progress. How are we performing as a company, both in individual departments, and how does that roll up into financial performance? They hear stories about people within the company. There's blogs for different divisions. They found that a year after they created this, employee engagement went up 6%, from 80% to 86%, which is world-class levels of employee engagement. They also found that trust and leadership went up 15%. It's now at 80%. So there's a high degree of engagement from employees and a high level of understanding of what it is that the company stands for and what their role is with it. About a year ago, they had a new CEO come to Golden, and he's from Europe. And he spent some time in pubs around Denver, which is, you know, an awful way to have to spend your job as a CEO, right? So he looked at what was going on, what kind of beers were on tap, and he said, there's a lot of competition for microbrews in Colorado because we love our specialty beers. And he said, I looked around, and Coors was not on tap at all of these pubs, a Coors product. He said, this is our very own backyard. If we can't rule and be number one and own our own backyard, then something's horribly wrong. And he started a three-month program that for employees in Golden, about 200 people, and it's called Reclaim Colorado. And they gave every employee a $35 allowance for beer a month. And they said, we want you to go out, and we want you to buy people beer. You can buy it and take it to your neighborhood barbecue. If you see somebody at a liquor store and they're buying a fat tire, ask them if they've tried a Blue Moon and, and buy it for them. If you're at a bar and you talk to somebody, buy them a Coors product. And then these employees came back and they shared these stories on Yammer and they shared pictures. The interesting part is that one of the most engaged group of employees who did this were the accounting people because they could finally get out, they could finally be the cool people. They were out there buying people beer, and people loved them. So they came back and they shared these stories about what it was like to be an ambassador for the brand. This is a woman who was pregnant and her friends threw her a baby shower and she said, well, just because I can't drink doesn't mean I can't share a great beer with my friends. So her party favor from the, from the uh, baby shower was a can of Blue Moon with an orange on top wrapped up in little baby saran wrap. They had over 220 stories that were shared on Yammer by employees, 30% of the employees. And they know that there are more employees who participated because they get all the receipts and they reimburse the employees. So they see a tremendous amount of traction with this. Now there's three reasons that Molson Coors was so successful with this. The first is that they made sure to create a single purpose for what it was the company stood for. They had a clear voice, a distinct voice, and they were very clear about the vision. And then they made sure to ingrain it within the company with everything that they talked about and everything that they did. The second thing that Jill did is that she reallocated that communication pie. And instead of spending 80% of the time talking about things that are mundane and administrative and boring, she took an approach and she said, I want our tone to be refreshingly unpretentious. When you sit at a pub and you have a beer with a friend, you're not talking in a tone that's pretentious. You are a real person. The third thing that they did is that they empowered employees to create experiences on behalf of the brand that the brand felt perfectly comfortable for the employees to do. So this is what I want you to start thinking about as you think about creating content-driven experiences for your, your employees. I want you to start thinking about how does the content that I create not just 
inform employees, but how does it actually create an experience that they can be a part of? Now, when I talk about experiences, what I'm talking about is both the digital and the physical content that we create that delivers value to our employees. We talk a lot about the value that we have to deliver to customers. We have an equal, if not greater, responsibility to deliver value to our employees. And what is it that will start to build that emotional connection with the brand? Because we want to think about what is it that we want the employees to feel about our brand? Because when they have that emotional connection, they think different about their behavior and what it is that they do.